Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem ones and zeros. We're given an array of binary strings and two integers, m and n. It's gonna be fun saying those two because they sound so similar. So suppose these are the binary strings that were given. There's five of them. Each of them is composed of just ones and zeros. And we're given a couple integers. Let's say m in this case is five and n in this case is three, just like in this example over here. We want to return from this the length of the largest subset of this set of strings we can create if we're allowed to use at most this many zero characters. So M in this case corresponds to zero and these are the zeros in our input strings and N corresponds to one. So these ones over here and we can use at most three ones and at most five zeros so i guess the first thing you might consider is can we just take all of these strings all five of them well how many zeros would we get in that case we'd get one two three four five six seven that's too many zeros how many ones would we get in that case i think we're allowed to get three but we would get one two three four five six seven so more than we're allowed to get. So we definitely can't take all five of these strings. So then how do we intelligently figure out how many we can get? Well, the brute force way to solve this problem would be with a decision tree. So for each one of these, we consider if we include it. So in this path, maybe we're including that string and the other path is where we skip it and we don't include it. And we make this same decision for every single string. So continuing with this decision tree here, we can either choose to include 0001 or we skip it. Here, we can do the same thing, include it or skip it. So you can see each one of these paths is going to tell us by the time we get all the way to the bottom, each one of these paths is gonna tell us which one of these we would have included or not included. And each one of these paths will be a different subset. And how do we know which one we're going to return from all of those? Well, we're gonna find the one that is the longest as in it has the most strings in it. And let's say in this case, that's gonna give us a four. We're gonna get a set of four. I think that would look like this, these four over here, because in that case, we'll have three ones and we'll have five zeros. So these four do satisfy our requirements and it's the longest possible set we could create. The largest it has four strings in it. So that's what we would return. Now this brute force approach, the size of this decision tree, the height of it is going to be in the worst case, the length of the strings. Well, the size of this array, that's the height of this tree is going to be, we can call that n and we're going to be branching twice every single time so to calculate the size of the tree it's going to be roughly 2 to the power of n so it's not super efficient how can we make this better well as we go along this decision tree we're going to be keeping track of how many m's and n's we have initially it's five and three this is how many we have available to us and then when we go down to this path we don't have five and three remaining we have four zeros remaining and two ones remaining because we used one of each and by the time we get down here we have three less m's remaining because those keep track of zeros so instead of having four and two like over here we'd have one and one because we used three zeros and we used one of our ones and we'd keep doing this now we're keeping track of our m's and our n's but we have a third variable which is going to be i it's going to tell us which string we're currently at first we start at the first string then we go to the second string then we go to the third that like decides what level of this tree we're in as well so we in total have three parameters m and an i but we can use these three parameters to implement a dynamic programming technique called caching or aka memoization but we have to calculate how many possible combinations will there be for these three parameters well for m there's going to be what the capacity of m possibly was so we'll just use m to denote itself same with n it can't have more possibilities than these it'll be from zero all the way through what the true value of n is passed in as a parameter so we'll have m times n 
times the length or the number of strings we have in the input let's say that's s so overall this is how many times the function could be called our recursive function when we cache the result every time we compute a possible value for it we're going to cache it and then we're never going to have to repeat that work this time complexity will be the same as the memory complexity as well because this is the size of our cache now let me show you what i've been talking about this entire time so this is going to be the memoization code i'm going to show you our cache is initially going to be this dynamic programming hash map it stands for dynamic programming this is our recursive function i'm going to call it dfs you can call it what you'd like but we have three parameters i m and n the other parameters we don't have to worry about because this function is nested inside of this one so in this recursion we know it's going to be pretty simple but we do have to worry about a few base cases one is what if we go out of bounds like how do we know when we can stop going through all the strings well when our pointer i is equal to the length of that array in which case we can return zero because there's zero strings that we could add at that point if we don't have any left to choose from and the other base case is if this has already been computed meaning if this tuple is already a key in our dp hash map then we're just going to return the value that this key corresponds to now if neither of the base cases execute then we actually have our recursive step so we're going to call dfs now we have two choices remember we can either not include the value not include the string at index i what would we do in that case then we're going to call dfs on i plus one and we're going to leave m and n the same we're not going to do anything with them now the other case is if we're going to include the string at index i in that case we're still going to pass in i plus one we're going to go to the next string but what are we going to pass in for m and n because we have to count how many zeros were in the string which string am i talking about well it's the string at index i we have to count how many zeros there were so i'm going to run that function count the number of zero characters we also have to count the number of one characters so let's do the same thing here and let's store these in a couple variables let's say m count and n count and then using these counts we're going to subtract from these variables so m the new count of m is going to be what it originally was minus the m's in the current string that we just used same thing for n so let's do just this now we have our two recursive calls what do we want to do with them we want to figure out which one led to the maximum that's what we're trying to do here we're trying to find what is the maximum number of strings we could include without overflowing these two restrictions so let's just take the max of both of these i'm going to write it like this i don't know what the cleanest way to write it in python is but i'm going to put it onto multiple lines this max we're going to set it equal to the value but we're going to store it in our dp hash map using this as the key and we of course want it to be set to the maximum and then after that we're going to go ahead and return that same value actually i missed something here maybe you already caught it but how do we know that the remaining count of m and the remaining count of n is actually valid what if this became negative that means we didn't have enough zeros or ones to actually use the string at index i in the first place so actually we have to change this a bit i think the easiest way to write it is to initially set the value in dp equal to this value where if we were to skip the string at index i and then we check this if m count is less than or equal to how many m's we're allowed to use and n count is less than or equal to the number of n's we're allowed to use then in that case we will possibly be able to set the new dp value equal to a different one we'll have to set it equal to the max of what it currently is and the max of this call down here so let me cut that and 
add it down here, clean this up a bit, but maybe this was even more educational to have caught a bug live as we're coding. So these are the two cases. Now we just have to actually call our DFS. We'll start at index zero. Our M and N count will be whatever is supplied to us up here. And then we're just gonna return the value that we compute from that. Ah, there was one last bug and it's over here. If we are choosing to include the string at index i, then the total number of strings is, yes, going to be the total number of strings from the sub problem, which is if we were to have this new m and n remaining and starting at i plus one, but we have to include the string that we just added. So we're going to say one plus the result of this sub problem if we actually do include the string. If we don't include the string, we don't have to put a plus one because we didn't include anything. We just have to go and solve this sub problem. I hope that clears it up, but now let's run the code. And as you can see, it works and it's pretty efficient. Let me quickly show you the more efficient dynamic programming solution without recursion. Now, if we were to code this up without recursion, we could do so with three loops because in this case, our cache is gonna be three dimensions. We're gonna follow very similar ideas. We're gonna use the same key as you can see over here. We're using I, M, and N as the composite key. For the string, we are counting how many zeros and ones it has. And then we're iterating through possible m and n values. In this case, m and n are once again going to, whoops, refer to how many zeros and how many ones we have remaining. So we're gonna use the count of the string to make sure we have enough to actually use this string. And if we do have enough to use it, then we're gonna take the max of pretty much the same value that we used before, one plus the sub problem dp now here instead of saying i plus one we're doing i minus one because we're iterating through from left to right you could iterate in reverse i'll show you that one in just a second but here we're iterating in the opposite direction so we're doing i minus one that's the sub problem so in this case i refers to we're allowed to use the string at index i and every previous string that's kind of like the sub problem in this case that's why we say i minus one when we look to solve a sub problem now if we're not allowed to use it then we just set it equal to the value at i minus one because yes we can't use the string at i at index i but we're allowed to use every previous string so we just take the max value from i minus one with the same m and n values and then we will return the value at the largest possible indices in this case actually i changed the m and n to be capital so then i can actually use these two as like iterators through our loops but you can see otherwise this is pretty similar to the recursive solution the complicated part is pretty much just figuring out which direction to iterate through and also that here we need to start at zero instead of one the reason being, in some cases, we might decide to use zero occurrences of a character of a zero or a one. We can choose to not include any if we want to. But otherwise, this is the iterative solution. The time and space complexity is pretty much the same. Though now, let me show you a way we can actually improve the space complexity. And this is how we could do it. You can see we are once again using a hash map. The fact that this is a default deck just means that if we go out of bounds, it's going to return a default value, in this case, an integer, and the value is going to be zero, which is exactly what we need in our case. This is pretty similar, except we are iterating in reverse order. And the previous solution I actually showed you will not pass. I think it gives time limit exceeded, even though the time complexity is the same as the recursive one. Leak code is just kind of weird, but this one will pass. This iterative solution will pass on leak code because it's a bit more efficient, not just because we're using less memory. Here, you can see when we set a value, we're setting it once again equal to the max, but we're not using I as a key in our hash map. And we are iterating through this in reverse order while the M and N values in reverse order because the way we build the grid, and it's gonna be hard to explain, so let me go back to the whiteboard real quick. We know that our cache is three dimensions, so it's gonna be hard to describe it visually, but let's say that 
This is one of the layers of the three dimensions. This is like our grid M by N. This is for I equals one, basically the first string. And then we have another grid over here for I equals one, the second string. Previously, I showed us filling in the grid like this from top to bottom. This is what I meant when I said top to bottom. But suppose from this position, sometimes we need to take our M value and subtract it. So we have to look up. From here, if we want to fill in the value at this position, we have to look above us. Sometimes we have to subtract from the N, so we have to look to the left. So we might have to look to the left or up or maybe even to the top left because if we use the current string, then we have less zeros and less ones remaining to choose from. So we have to possibly look in this direction. When we look in that direction, we never look at the same grid. We never look at the same I value right now. What we're doing is taking the I value and saying I minus one. We're going to look in the previous grid and we're going to look at it going in the top left direction. Now what I'm doing instead of having both of these grids in memory, though, I'm only keeping a single grid in memory because I want to reduce the memory complexity from being N times M times S. I'm changing it to now only be N times M. So doing it this way, if we fill this in going top to left, and then when we get to here and we want to look in the top left, but what we actually want to find is the original value that we stored up here. But if we overwrote that, we can't do that anymore. So what we instead do is don't fill top to bottom. We fill bottom to top top so like this so now if we got to this position and looked at the top left we would find the original values we would never search bottom or to the right so we'd never even care what we have stored here we'd only look at the top left so that's why we're doing this in reverse order and lastly not only are we doing it in reverse order but here starting at m we're going to go up until the count minus one the number of zeros minus one and the reason we have the minus one here is just because in Python, this last value is non-inclusive. So we have to go one past that. But the reason we're going up until M count is because we don't need to go to any values smaller than that. Because if we need three zeros for this current string, why should we even consider any of the loop iterations where we have less than that? Why should we even consider any of the loop iterations where we only have zero zeros or maybe we only have two zeros, but we need three of them. So we're not even going to consider this iteration of the loop. This is kind of a shortcut and this is what helps get this solution to pass on leak code. So lastly, I'll run this just to prove it to you that it does work. And as you can see, it does, but the runtime is kind of random on leak code. I don't really pay too much attention to it, but if this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.